Hi guys, and welcome to Uncle Scott's Kitchen. In this video, we are doing a deep dive on enameled cast iron Dutch ovens, Le Creuset versus Stove. This video is actually a follow-up video to a big video I put up about two weeks ago now called Le Creuset versus Stove. The debate is officially over. Um, what I want to do is provide a little bit more information. Got a lot of feedback from you guys on that video, so we're gonna go through some of that. We're also gonna talk accessories, uh, gonna talk cleanup, gonna talk the difference in those interior colors, light versus dark, and more. So let's jump in and get started. First up, let's talk pronunciation. Got several comments on this. Are we pronouncing these brand names correctly? Probably not. I have enough problems with English. My French is essentially non-existent but am I pronouncing Le Creuset correctly? Let's see, um, Dadigan 5117 and Tyler Smith 3139 both point out that I should be saying that L-E is more of a la sound rather than a lay pronunciation. Is that correct? I think if you go by the correct French pronunciation, um, they are right. But I will point out, however, that on the official Le Creuset YouTube channel, in their own in-house produced videos, they pronounce it Le Creuset as well. They also have a, another video entitled How to Correctly Pronounce Le Creuset, and they say La, but in some of their videos on the official site, they say Le. Now, what about Stobe? Some people are saying it's a, it's a French brand. It should be pronounced more like Staub. Um, I think it's actually probably a German uh, family name that was acquired by Zilling or who knows what went on in the corporate world. But in their in-house produced official videos, they pronounce it as Stobe. So if we're in America and say Stobe and Le Creuset, I think we are okay because that's what the companies do themselves. Let's see, Hal Laurent in C-Dub42 um, both wrote in about uh, cleanup and stains and deglazing. And what I want to show here, I didn't mention anything about cleanup in that uh, other video. Now you may want to avert your eyes here because we know the Le Crusades have the lighter interior. I'm telling you, go ahead and avert your eyes, but I made some Popozo. And Popozo is essentially, it's an Italian recipe where you braise beef in red wine. And this had that braising going on for about three hours. Are you ready? You may want to avert your eyes. Ah! So what I thought we might do is give this guy a wash and clean up here on camera. Okay, let's see if these stains come off now. All right, so those Popozo, those red wine stains, I've actually been in there about 36 hours because I meant to do this video yesterday and that didn't happen. Everything cleaned right up. So no stains there. Now these Le Crusades are gonna get stained over time. And one thing I like is that Zagnut, Zagnut Bar pointed out, and he's absolutely right if it's a he, um, a stained piece of cookware means you actually cook with it. That's a badge of honor, and I do agree with that. So this is a one or two month old Le Creuset, and I expect this thing to get stains and scratches over time, and that just means I actually do cook with it. Now the, the uh, darker interiors on the stoves, I think you probably get the exact same amount of staining on those darker interiors, but you just can't see it. Now further along the lines of cleaning, I've had some people write in and say that if you do get stains in your Le Crusades, you can put bleach in there and kind of bleach those stains away. I just mentally can't wrap my head around putting bleach in my good cookware, but some people do it. A little bit deeper dive on the cleaning here in the Stobe uh, instruction booklet. They mention that you can, if you need to, you can put your enamel cast iron Dutch oven through the dishwasher. Um, 
I just don't do that as well. Uh, my nice cookware, I tend to baby it, take meticulous care of it, and I wash all this good stuff by hand. But in a pinch, if you really needed to, you could put one of these things through the dishwasher. And speaking of the instruction booklets, um, both the Lake Crusade and Stobe also mention, and this is a good segue to accessories, to um, use softer utensils in the, um, in the Dutch ovens. Uh, some people I see using metal whisks and using metal utensils in their enamel cast iron. I don't do that. Um, I've got some of these softer ones. These are actually made by Stobe and they got the, uh, the wood handle on there. Um, these are nice to use. Also, I have a coated whisk. I don't like to use a metal whisk in my enamel cast iron. I don't want to put any undue scratching on the surface. So obviously not necessary to get the branded um, official, if you will, Stobe or Lake Crusade products, but they are kind of nice to have. Now I do notice these wood handles, they do tend to fade just a little bit. And what happens around here, I know I shouldn't do it, but sometimes they just get stuck in the sink after cleaning up and they get wet. I know I should wash them and dry them immediately, but sometimes that just does not happen. A couple other accessories which I consider to be absolutely essential. The first is one of these lid holders. Uh, Dutch ovens, if you're cooking and you've got the lid on there, they all trap uh, moisture, keep uh, a, lot, a lot of moisture underneath. And if you take the lid off while you're cooking, it's often very, very wet. And if you set it down, on a countertop it's going to make a mess usually there's no good place to put these things especially if you're holding a camera in one hand doing a youtube video but if you've got one of these lid holders they work really really nicely and also the lid holder has a little i guess you would call it a little reservoir in there so any moisture that does run off the lid is trapped down in there. So consider that to be essential. Also, very crucial, especially with the bigger Dutch ovens, like the, the seven quarts and like this one is a nine quart. If you do any slow simmering, um, once you get these things up to heat, it doesn't take as much heat to maintain a simmer or a boil. And on a gas stove in particular, if I turn the flame way down, that can lead to kind of a hot spot in the middle of a very large pan and you run some risk of uh, food sticking there. What I like to use is a copper diffuser plate. So you put this over the burner and put the Dutch oven on that. And for those slow simmers, that really spreads out the heat, diffuses it obviously, and uh, leads to significantly better simmering performance. Lots of people like their stoves for the decorative knobs. Um, they come in different animals, um, Rabbits, chickens, pigs, cows, etc., etc. Snails. I don't have the snail. Um, several people wrote in about those. First, uh, Beverly Spect 5306 wrote in to say that the holes in the Dutch ovens are the same size and that um, the, the uh, stove decorative knob knobs will fit on a Lake Crusade. So let's definitely try that out right now. And where's a Lake Crusade lid? Okay, so what we're going to do is change out the screw here. And this one is a standard screw. Loosens right up. Now I have to be careful around here. I don't like my wife to see me using any type of tool because it may inspire her to go to Ikea and buy a shelf. And that could very easily ruin a Saturday morning. Okay, so Lake Crusade knob comes right out. There's the hole. Let's try a stove decorative knob. Probably should have practiced this before. So I hate doing things in real time. Video. So this one is the rabbit. And we're gonna put him on Lake Crusade. I note that the stove has a Phillips head screw. And Justin Imlay pointed out a tip here that regardless of these knobs, you may want to triple check that you don't over tighten the knobs so that you don't crack the uh, enamel. 
that snug but not overly tight. Probably pretty good advice for almost any type of uh, nuts and bolts and screws right there. Never over tighten. And there is a stove rabbit knob on a Le Creuset lid. And seems to work and fit pretty well. Let's talk a little bit about snoot factor. These are high-end fancy items and are they worth the money? Several people commented on this um, really talking about how much these cost. Um, Mr. 4224 uh, said that the fact that people waste $500 buying a glorified iron pot is a testament to the amazing marketing these companies have spent millions on. Um, are these things outrageous? Are they overpriced? Are we paying up just for brand? There's probably some truth here either way. Um, a lot of it depends on what you're into and what you enjoy in life. But I'm gonna point out that this guy here is an almost 20 year old Tramontina, my first Dutch oven that I bought at Walmart. And it shows Lots of use, and if you're interested in what a, an, a lighter interior is going to look like down the road after lots of cooking, that's a pretty good estimation there. And what I want to say here is that lots of us start out in that Tramontina Walmart demographic. And it's not always where you start, it's where you finish. And there's nothing wrong with being in that demographic. And if you got 30, 40, 50 bucks for a Dutch oven, have at it, that's what I did myself. However, as you get older in life and your tastes change and you're more able to afford some nicer things, and if, especially if you're really into cooking and cookware and nice stuff in your kitchens, then I think it is nice to move up in the categories to the Lake Crusades and the stove. And I'm gonna point out they're not always as expensive as the less price might indicate if you're opportunistic and wait on sales. I didn't pay list price for any of these, and a lot of these I got for close to 50% off. And for example, around the holidays and Black Friday, you could get into a stove, a five, five and a half quart, very versatile size stove for about $150. So not that prohibitive these days. Um, what's that, a pair of uh, concert tickets, maybe one fancy meal out. You get a piece that's gonna last 20, 30 years. Um, heirloom piece that your descendants are going to inherit from you someday. And I should also acknowledge there are some Asian kind of knockoffs or clones or copies of these things. And on a molecular level, maybe they're the same thing. I don't know about that. One thing I always worry about with some of the cheaper Dutch ovens, especially the ones coming in from Asia, is anyone cutting corners anywhere? Is there lead in the glaze? Um, what type of paints do they use? Um, I worry about that a little bit, and with Stove and Lake Crusade, I don't mind paying up a little bit more because there is a level of trust, and I will keep that level of trust until it is ever broken with the uh, French-made uh, cookware. Penny for penny, if you don't worry about any of the other factors, you can probably get similar cooking performance to some of these higher-end brands and some of the lower-end brands, but that does not necessarily make me happier in life. One of the best comments I have received, not only on that previous video, but any video I have done, is from VisitCart. And he, he or she says, happy to see a new video, and here's what I really like. It says, it feels like visiting an old friend and cooking and chatting together. If anything sums up the entire foundation for Uncle Scott's Kitchen, I think this comment does. Um, we do get specifics on recipes, on cookware, on food, on wine, but really it's just hanging out with like-minded people from around the world and talking about food and wine and cookware and nice stuff in the kitchen that we all enjoy. And when I talk about people around the world watching this, I am not kidding. Lorento Gitatex, not sure exactly how to pronounce that, wrote in from France and said he grew up a short walk from the Le Creuset factory Obviously, he uh, leans a little bit more to Lake Rousset. And he mentioned the black Lake Rousset. I showed him that other video. He said he's curious about this, and it seems strange to him. And it says it just does not look right. I think he's probably accurate there, because with Lake Rousset, you expect that lighter interior. And also, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, Boyan Turinfonov wrote in from Bulgaria. So very nice. I think it's the first time I've had someone write in from Bulgaria. 
And talking about the Lake Crusades, he's a big Lake Crusade fan. He says he's got 10 Lake Crusades and two stoves. He likes them both. He leans a little bit towards the uh, Lake Crusade side, but was talking about the nine quart models, which I was mentioning in the previous video and the weight of those models. He says for his parents in their mid to late 60s, those are very heavy and they have trouble moving those around. And he suggests uh, something in that five quart range. He likes the um, five quart Lake Crusade and says his mom can handle that very easily. So if you were looking for one to start with somewhere in that five quart range, it's probably a very versatile size. And he goes on to say they are functional beauties. And I agree with that completely. Another thing I like about both the Lake Crusade and stoves as opposed to Tramontinas and some of the other brands is that there's a sense of community. Uh, people talk about these, they fall in love with them. Um, if you're over on Facebook, there are Lake Crusade groups, there are stove groups and people, they post deals when they see them and they post pictures of their stoves and the recipes they make. So there's a nice sense of community you get with both of these brands that you don't often get with some of the others. Speaking of the interior colors, uh, people were talking about I mentioned in the video that it was easier to see down in the Lake Crusade, but I could also see very well down into the stove. Several people mentioned that it wasn't just about being able to see down in there, but also uh, browning and developing a fond and deglazing. I should have called that out just a little bit more. So let's show a little bit of that in both brands. And I'm gonna show here making some Popozo in both brands. Here's the Lake Crusade browning the beef, a nice browning in there and I deglazed with some red wine down in there and everything went well. Here making some Popozo in a stove. Browning the beef, I think the browning uh, was very nice there and also deglazing that pan with red wine. So I could get browning in a fond and deglaze with both brands. There probably is a little bit of truth. It's a little bit easier to see down in the uh, Lake Crusade when you're doing that. But I think anybody watching this video is probably into cooking and is not going to have any trouble doing the same thing in the stoves as well. Let's see, back on pronunciation a little bit. Uh, Shingle Picker asked about the soup I made in the previous video that was ribolita. It's an Italian vegetable soup and he could not understand what I said. So it's R-I-B-O-L-L-I-T-A and that is the past participle of boliri. Uh, to boil in Italian, and if you redo it, you're reboiling it. So it's reboiled, is what it literally means, but the name of the soup is ribolita. And not to get too far out here into the weeds on accents and pronunciation, I grew up on a farm in Alabama, and early on I had a deep southern accent. I got a job out in Colorado working at a ski resort. Um, I was actually in the accounting office, so kind of a ski bum with ambition, I guess you could say. But I would go in and talk to my boss, and my boss could not understand me with my southern accent. So I kind of came to the conclusion, I got to get rid of this damn accent or I'm never going to move up in life. So I kind of got rid of my southern accent, but sometimes my pronunciation with, especially French and foreign languages, may be off just a little. Let's see, G. Anthony Benjamin 281 wrote in also about that ribolita soup. And in that recipe, I started with a sofrito, which is some uh, chopped up celery, carrots, and onions, and softened those in some olive oil as a base for that soup. That is also called a mirepoix if you're in uh, France. And he points out that it's a Le Creuset French Dutch oven. Shouldn't it be a mirepoix? This one kind of has me thinking a little bit because it is French cookware, but I'm also making an Italian recipe. Now I spend a couple of years in Italy and speak just enough Italian to get myself in trouble. So I tend to go with sofrito, but they are kind of variations on a the theme. And here I don't know exactly. Now, if you're unfamiliar with sofritos and mirepoix, they generally have a base of carrots, celery, and onions. And there are nuances depending on which culture you're in. I think in Spain, they might add tomatoes. Um, the French might use a little bit heavier on onion. I typically go roughly um, equal parts of uh, each ingredient, but it, with a soup, it doesn't matter that much. If you got a little extra carrot or a little extra onion, you might as well just throw it in. <clears throat> Sometimes the Italians might use um, garlic or other herbs, uh, Cajuns might use bell pepper in theirs and uh, Nutria rat 
But if I were gonna give out five cooking tips, one of the five would be to learn how to make a mirepoix or a sofrito. And whether you call it mirepoix or sofrito, does it depend on the recipe or does it depend on the cookware? I'm gonna have to actually think about that for a while. Hmm. And not to get too far out in the weeds here, but one thing you learn about Italian food. Um, early on, especially growing up in America, you think of Italian food as pizza, pasta, red sauce, meatballs, spaghetti and meatballs, on and on, lots of garlic. When you spend some time in Italy, you learn there is a wide variety of Italian food. Um, up in uh, Tuscany, I went in a restaurant one time and they had baked chicken with carrots and broccoli. And that's very similar, uh, slight difference, but very similar to the way we used to eat it growing up on the farm in Alabama. And I got a buddy from Rome, real deal Roman guy, and he will not touch garlic, absolutely hates it. So we need to be careful before we stereotype um, everyone from a certain culture. Okay, and what about the overall thesis of the video? That it can be difficult to, to choose between Le Creuset and Stowe because they're both fantastic and both very evenly matched. It might produce more happiness if you have at least one of each. Seems like most everyone was supportive of that thesis. Uh, let's see. Uh, the Foolish Hiker 3103 says, with either of the brands, I think you're getting a good quality product that will last generations. Uh, Janet Carter, 6975, says she's with me, one of each. Lindy Sells Home says has one of each and absolutely agrees they are friends in the kitchen. I like that. Now, I found sentiments like this throughout the comments section below the video. Lots of people do have both brands and they like them both, but some people will kind of lean towards one versus the other. For the people that lean Le Creuset, they do tend to like that lighter interior. For the people that have the stoves, they like the darker interior, and they also like the decorative knobs. That was called out several times there. Um, I think those knobs do give the uh, Dutch ovens a little bit more personality. And finally, J.D. Haynes says, he's like me. He has a mix of both and in different colors. He said he can't decide which one he likes, so he buys both. So what do you guys think? Do you have more comments on the Stoves versus Lake Crusades or Stoves and Lake Crusades? Let me know in the comments section below. Thank you for watching. We'll see you again next time on Uncle Scott's Kitchen.